Good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Lawrence, and I'll be the moderator uh, for this session, uh, which is the Crawford Symposium on Critical Issues. In 1988, uh, Stanley Crawford, a past president of the Society for Vascular Surgery and one of the giants in our field, instituted a uh, critical issues seminar. He felt that at our annual meeting that there should be an opportunity to discuss not only scientific topics, but also issues that might be of critical importance to vascular surgeons. When Dr. Crawford died in 1993, uh, this was named the Stanley Crawford Symposium in Critical Issues. And since that time, it's been the responsibility of the president-elect to select a topic and select the speakers. This year, I've chosen as the topic uh, one that I believe has been of great issue to not only vascular surgeons, but also to the public and physicians in general. As those of you who follow the uh, lay press know, in the New York Times and New Yorker, there have been long detailed articles by well-known authors such as Atul Gawande and Elizabeth Rosenthal on issues related to physician overuse of procedures. And they both have identified physician-owned centers as one of the causes of the excessive cost of health care and have calculated how much different our health care costs would be if these procedures were not overused. This hasn't only been, though, through the lay press. And in fact, several uh, organizations have developed lists of overused procedures. Consumer Reports now has for the readers of Consumer Reports a list of a number of procedures which they tell their readers to avoid because they're grossly overused and unnecessary. And in fact, the SVS participated uh, in a project that was called Choosing Wisely. And this was uh, published and uh, also uh, was reported uh, in a lay uh, and physician uh, outlet, which is called uh, Medscape. Those of you who see it online know that this identifies top issues and articles. And in 2013, the number one topic and the number one issue was over-testing and over-treating. But this has also come to the field of vascular surgery. And uh, in the Vascular Specialist, which is our online newspaper, uh, both Frank Veith and Russ Sampson have written editorials about the potential overuse of vascular procedures. Uh, Dr. Veith titled his uh, topic, The Black Snake Phenomenon, and pointed out that not everything that we find and identify needs to be treated. And Russ had a, an editorial called the 5% thing, in which he pointed out that procedures with very low risk, uh, when they have a, a risk or a complication, are 100% to the patient who has the problem. So both of them have pointed out that we should be very careful about doing procedures that may uh, potentially harm patients, even if they have a rel relatively low risk. So Rusk, one of your other uh, editorials, I think you talked about whether you were using invisible ink because people seem to not be responding and, and uh, writing back to you as the editor. And I can assure you that this session uh, should prove to you that it hasn't been invisible ink. In fact, that many of us in the audience have been reading vascular specialists and know that this is a significant problem and the potential overuse of procedures in vascular surgery. So today we have five experts that are going to address different aspects of the topic, the appropriate use of vascular procedures, do we have a problem? And each of us, them is going to come from a different perspective. Please hold your questions until the end. We hope that we have approximately 30 minutes at the end uh, for discussion and questions. So please hold your questions. And we've charged each of the speakers with coming up with three potential solutions, at least two potential solutions in their, in their area that they're discussing.
So our, so our first speaker today is Dr. Robert Zwolak, who does, probably does not need an introduction, but I'll give a brief one. Bob is the past president of the SVS. He's also the health policy consultant for the SVS. And in addition to that, Bob works at Dartmouth. He's a chief of surgery at the VA. And as you probably know, Dartmouth has their Center for Health Policy and has been reporting for years on variations in particular procedures. And that's the source of the Dartmouth Atlas of Vascular Procedures, procedures where they show variability. So Bob is going to talk to us about and speak on data about vascular procedures. Do we have a problem? Dr. Zwolak. Thanks very much, Peter, and good morning. I apologize for my voice. I hope it lasts through this. Peter asked me to be provocative, and so I'll do my best here. I have no disclosures. So what kind of variation is there? Certainly the surgical scientists look at regional variation, and while the experts at, at Dartmouth, people like Jack Cronenwitt and Phil Goodney, Brian Nolan, and David Stone, and, as well as a large number of residents and fellows who have trained there are experts in regional variation, I, I certainly am not, but I'll provide some data. I am a little bit more of an expert expert on variation with what Medicare considers to be an issue, and they look mostly at uh, variation over time. So what drives regional variation? Does payment uh, drive temporal or variation over time? What other variables do drive it? And my charge here is to, to look at major variation and opine whether we have a problem. So I'd like to talk about uh, carotids, lower extremity treatments, aneurysms, and vein disease. I'll start with regional variation in carotids, and this is part of the scientific issue. This is a Goodney et al. paper from 2010 where he looked at carotids and carotid stenting and noticed a significant difference in variation over time over that decade. And in fact, their analysis indicated that potentially the distribution in the regions was specialty specific with a statistically significant relationship between the percent of cardiologists in each hospital referral region and the percent of carotid stenting procedures that was done. And what does Medicare think about variation? Do they, do they look at specialties much? And I think Medicare looks with a much more blunt instrument. So, so, so Medicare, although they don't really come out and say this, suggests that misvalued codes may have relationship to volume. And so, so this, is, this might be a postulated Medicare graph where this sweet spot right in the middle is where providers think the payment is just about right, and so they don't have any discretionary impact on volume, but then if the payment gets to be fairly generous, uh, Medicare might opine that the volume of the procedures annually goes up, and on the other end, perhaps, if the providers perceive it as too low, the volume may go down. Well, let's look at carotids and carotid treatments. This graph shows from 2001 to 2013 carotid stents and carotid endarterectomy. I'll say that the carotid uh, data and all the data to follow in 2013 is taken from the provider file, which is called an early file. So all claims up to December 31st. And it's not, it, it's always a good estimate, but it is an estimate for 2013. Nevertheless, there's a huge change here, a 42% reduction in annual carotid treatments over the decade. You see that carotid stents started 2004 have remained relatively flat around 10,000 per year, probably related to the restrictive coverage environment, but carotid endarterectomy seen here in red and the total treatments in blue have come down at an enormous rate over the decade. We brought carotid endarterectomy to CMS and to the RUC and said we thought it was a little bit undervalued, and in fact, they gave us a very slight increase in payment in 2014. We'll see what that does, but to show what a contentious environment the world is, the American Academy of Family Practice decried the $38 increase in payment for carotid endarterectomy that Medicare granted in 2014. Uh, so we do we have a problem with carotids? Well, as, as you saw from the Holman's lecture, that we still don't know exactly who should receive carotid endarterectomy, carotid stent, or best medical therapy, but this is an issue that we will indeed figure out sooner or later. The carotid stent proponents worry that the tight CMS coverage restrictions prevent them or prevent us from retaining our skills. The American Academy of Family Practice thinks CMS aired when it granted a 9% work RVU increase for carotid endarterectomy, but is there a volume problem? I don't think so. Lower extremities. Here's another 
pretty impressive graph of procedures over time. This is the annual event of major lower extremity amputations in Medicare beneficiaries from 1996 to 2013. We must be doing something right. So the blue is total major lower extremity amps includes all above knee and below knee amputations and the red and green lines are above and below knee amputations. This is a huge improvement. What about variation? Is there variation in vascular care? Well, there is. And in fact, again, another publication by Goodney et al. demonstrated variation exists in the intensity of vascular care provided to CLI patients in the year prior to amputation. The intensity of PAD treatment varied threefold across the United States during the year prior to major limb amp. Well, does that do any good? And happily enough, the data proved that it did. There's a major uh, relationship, a reduction in the rate of amputation in areas where there's more intense vascular care. So we may be part of the solution there. What about lower extremity bypass? Is that what's doing it? And the answer is, boy, I'm not sure there's been an enormous reduction in lower extremity bypass in the Medicare population. The amputation rate is coming down, but also the bypass rate is coming down. And the total extremity bypasses have decreased by 57% over the decade. Medicare might be interested in seeing these data. The payment in work RVUs for femdistal bypass has actually gone up by 60% over the last 20 years, and still there's been a substantial reduction in the bypass frequency. So, so we're not that sensitive to payment. Does payment impact arterial intervention. Well, now we get into some meaty stuff. So this is a CPT code 37227 for a femoral popliteal stent plus atherectomy. These are the payments for the 2014 fee schedule. And the, what you see here is a site of service, hospital outpatient or the physician's office. The Medicare payment to the physician in the hospital when you do this, you get $782 for a professional payment. But if you do it in your office because you buy the supplies and the equipment and you have to have a C-arm, you get paid $15,000 for Medicare. If the patient's procedure is done in the hospital outpatient, Medicare pays the hospital $15,510. So when the, payment, when the procedure is done entirely in the hospital as an outpatient, the total payment from Medicare is a little bit over $16,000. So you see, in fact, Medicare is saving about $1,000 if the procedure is done in the physician's office. Nevertheless, a pretty generous looking payment in the office. Has this come to Medicare's attention? Well, here we go. These are the top 20 codes for payments in 2013 ranked in the physician's fee schedule now by increase in allowed charges. So. The first one and the second one, as you might suspect, are outpatient visits. We, our family practice colleagues are concerned about payment for these, but in fact, in 2013, $9 billion was spent on 99214, the fourth, fourth level established visit for an increase of $590 million compared to 2012. And the, the mid-level visit, 992 and 3, 7 billion with a $338 million increase compared to 2012. But look what else is on the list. Number 13, the number 13th highest for raw numbers of dollars increase is our friend 37225 Fempop atherectomy, for which Medicare spent $111 million in one year, 2013, a $38 million increase over one year, or a 52% increase. That, I'm sure, has come to someone's attention in the payment side of the house at CMS. And number 18 on the list, 37227 Fempop stent plus atherectomy. Medicare spent $100 million on that, a $29 million increase over one year, 41%. So do we have a problem with lower extremities? Well, amputation's down 47%. We must get some credit for that. We must be doing something right. Open bypass surgery is disappearing. I think that's a major issue. Percutaneous intervention is way, way up, especially atherectomy. With limb salvage up, we need to know which of the cohorts of patients are getting atherectomy before we make any negative pronouncements about appropriateness or problems with intervention. We certainly don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Aneurysms. Another curve 
similar to the others, a 34% reduction in the total abdominal aortic aneurysms performed annually in the Medicare population between 2001 and 2013. A huge reduction in the green line, of course, what used to be my favorite operation, open aortic aneurysm repair, down to less than 4,000 cases per year in the entire United States. That's less than two cases per week in each state in the United States. It is disappearing. And EVAR has pretty much peaked out at about 2008, 2009, around 20,000 cases per year in Medicare and has remained relatively flat. Do we have a problem with triple A's? I don't think so. Surgeons, I believe, are acting responsibly in view of relatively newer treatment guidelines to operate at a larger diameter, now 5.5 centimeters. The prevalence of disease may actually be falling. The big question in my mind is how do we retain our skills and teach our trainees to do open aneurysm repair, or do we? Last but not least, veins. So here's your curve for veins. I can see people are awake anyway, Peter. <laughs> so, so this is the annual Medicare. Now, this is Medicare. Remember, many people, many, many people who have vein treatments are not Medicare beneficiaries. This is only Medicare. This is the, a combination of vein stripping, which is really all we had from 1996 to 2004 or so, uh, and endovenous ablation. So a 6,370% increase in annual treatments in the Medicare population. We're not, the, we're not the perps, the entire perps though, we're not the entire perpetrator of this group. In fact, the vascular surgical and general surgical uh, percentage of providers has gone down for radiofrequency ablation from over 80% to just over 40%. Uh, CT surgeons, uh, radiologists, cardiologists, family practice doctors, general practice doctors, internal medicine specialists, and others, I think perhaps even including veterinarians, are performing are performing laser and radio frequency ablation of so-called symptomatic veins. I will go back to the chart that I showed you before. Remember lines 13, fempop atherectomy, line 18, fempop stent and atherectomy, line 19 out of the top 20 is 36475, endovenous radio frequency vein ablation. And again, recall, this is just one out of four CPT codes that are used for endovenous ablation. $137 million paid by Medicare in 2013, a $27 million increase. So does payment drive vein treatments? Well, again, we're familiar with these charts now. If you do a vein treatment, a radiofrequency ablation in the hospital outpatient, the professional payment is $371. If you do it in the, your office, the payment is $1,699. The difference, of course, is that you have to buy the supplies, the equipment, the radiofrequency generator, and pay the nurses and the technologists. But if you're a smart shopper and a good manager, you can probably do pretty well in the office. And Medicare saves, what, $800 on the entire treatment if it's done in the office compared to the hospital outpatient. So what percentage is done in the office at this point? Almost all of them. What's the CMS response to rapid growth? So radiofrequency and laser venous ablation were caught in the screen for rapid growth by CMS. No surprise. A RUC survey was performed, multiple specialties participated. The skin-to-skin -skin time for radiofrequency ablation is down 25% according to surveys you all performed. So how do we get paid in work RVUs? Work RVUs, remember, is the product of skin-to-skin -skin time and complexity. Has the complexity of a radiofrequency vein ablation changed much over a decade? I don't think so. The time has come down 25%. We can potentially predict what CMS will do to the payments for radiofrequency vein ablation in 2015, as well as laser frequency vein ablation. Um, but, but the interesting question is, will pay cuts actually curb behavior, curb volume? It's hard to say. Do we have a problem with veins? A 6,000% increase in treatments is not likely due to increased disease prevalence. Prevalence of disease, in fact, may be increasing. Many people who are vein treatment advocates say that the less invasive treatment shifts the risk and benefit curves and the quality of life curves, so in fact, we should be doing more of these. Uh, but CMS, of course, believes that the tool they have that's most easy to exert their influence will be payment reduction. So my conclusions are, first, I think it's crucial for SVS to refine our strategy to train our fellows and residents and redefine our specialty in a world of rapidly disappearing open cases. This, 
to me, this is a, a big elephant in the room that we haven't quite faced yet. Payment may, in fact, impact provider behavior. I think this is the Achilles heel of fee-for-service technique. Practice guidelines, not pay cuts, should direct coverage and control volume. Again, practice guidelines, not pay cuts, should direct coverage and control volume. And being paid to do procedures in your office is okay, in my opinion, if you do the right procedure on the right patient with the right meaning excellent outcomes. So my three recommendations. I, I, su I suggest that SVS submit all of our very high quality practice guidelines to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Nas National Guideline Clearinghouse. Many, many, many professional specialties have done that, we haven't. I think we should develop more data surrounding the efficacy of intervention atherectomy in the periphery, and I believe we should develop focused practice guidelines for lower extremity arterial intervention once we have decent data to work on. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Bob. One of the issues that always comes up is whether competition between specialties has led to an increase in volume in certain areas and maybe whether competition has also led to reduced costs and improved care. The person I thought that would be best to address this is Mike Dake because he's had many hats over his career. He's not only a member of our society of the SVS, uh, but Mike is a, an interventional radiologist at Stanford who works in the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery, but much of his practice is working with the Division of Vascular Surgery, and he also is trained in vascular medicine and has boards in vascular medicine. And Micah, as you probably know, has done a number of phase one clinical trials, but also equally important, he's the director of the catheterization and angiography laboratories at Stanford Hospital, which are a multidisciplinary center. So Mike has worked in with all, virtually all specialties, and his topic is going to be optimizing multi-specialty involvement in vascular procedures. Mike Dake. Thank you very much, Peter, uh, for allowing me to participate in the forum this year. I will try to, as, as Bob did, adhere to your charge of being provocative, and we're going to talk about multi-specialty involvement in vascular procedures. These are my disclosures. I don't believe any are totally relevant to what we're going to be discussing. Now, overlap among different specialties interested in performing vascular innovations is, not, is nothing new. In January 1989, that's 25 years ago, this article in JAMA from Stanford described the phenomenon and offered an analysis with some suggestions of how conflicts might be solved. Then, as is true now, while there's never any right or wrong answer or perfect solution to such conflicts, it's clearly time for the issue to be discussed in a forthright manner. So like my predecessors, I'd like to offer you some perspectives. As was undoubtedly expected 25 years ago, I anticipate this topic is bound to provoke strong feelings and emotions with diverse ideas on how best to coexist harmoniously. Just as the response to the original JAMA piece stimulated commentaries and numerous letters for months to follow, uh, since then there's an undeniable, it's undeniable that certain aspects of health care in this country have evolved, and many have changed dramatically. The Affordable Care Act, physician employment by hospitals, shared risk models for patient coverage are all examples of how the landscape, landscape has shifted, and to some degree, this has put a squeeze on physicians in traditional medical practice. For the most part, there's a general appreciation that we're in the middle of a transition, but the destination is not clear, and the next steps are poorly defined. As a result of these changes, there exists a level of physician anxiety about a range of topics, from maintaining income levels, to changing practice models, to competition, and many more. But one institutional theme that's currently embraced is the rejection of individual charismatic enterprises in favor of organization-wide programs. This type of promotion seen here, just outside Boston, may have been in vogue in the past, but enlightened hospitals now favor and support sustainable, institutionally oriented programs with broad-based, multi-specialty engagement rather than individual, me-centric initiatives. In fact, multi-specialty involvement in vascular care is nothing new, as we know the concept has been the subject of dialogue for over 25 years. But now, perhaps more than ever, it may have special relevance. 
However, the reaction among different groups will vary to the question of how to manage competition for vascular procedures among multiple specialties with overlapping interests, privileges, and growth mandates. Remember this trio from the movie Princess Bride, Inigo Montoya, Vizzini, Fezzik? Just as each individual has different reactions to events, members of our specialties will respond differently to the current trend that progressive organizations will reward collaboration and team building. And some may explain inconceivable. But after hearing this time and again, others may question the use of inconceivable, just as Montoya did to Vizzini when he said, you keep saying that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Instead, the question should be, why should I care about much less promote multidisciplinary initiatives and collaborations. Well, I've listed four general platitudinous reasons, but I think at present it's clear that institutions and organizations are not interested in promoting specialty fiefdoms. No interest in preserving a row of specialty used car lots all competitively pushing the same product. Rather, they will increasingly support multidisciplinary programs where all stakeholders are expected to contribute with their oars in the water simultaneously in a coordinated effort to pull the institution's boat forward. NIH encourages multidisciplinary collaboration in its funding decisions. CMS may mandate a clinical team of different specialists for reimbursement of certain high-profile procedures, example, TAVR, and FDA clearly responds to multi-specialty consensus. In fact, our species' survival probably depends on how fast we embrace the cultural shift from patriot to global citizen. Causes us to think, where are we going? So as a jumping off point, let's examine some basic questions. What could you do to help establish a more robust and fruitful relationship with your peers interested in vascular disease? One that could enhance your practice and provide a more fulfilling experience. And the flip side, what shouldn't we do if we want to avoid provoking tension, resentment, and inflammatory turf wars? Well, let's take the latter. When it's discussion of multidisciplinarism, talk is, cheap, is certainly cheap. We clearly don't want to take a position that's consensually viewed by others as obstructionist or rigid. We don't want to adapt a zero-sum game approach. We don't want to be dissonant, beating our own drum. It's basically golden rule stuff. Don't run down or speak ill of others, their specialties or what they can contribute. Gone are the there will be blood days of Frank Plainview and I drink your milkshake, I drink it all up. Don't do this. Now, everyone's guilty of this, but this article in 2009 I think provoked some inflam inflammation. The conclusion, interventional radiology market share of peripheral interventions has precipitously declined while those of vascular surgery and interventional cardiology have increased significantly. Fact. Vascular surgeons had the lowest overall morbidity and mortality of all groups. And in the commentary, this comment, tooting our own horn should stand the future of vascular surgery in good stead. Predictably, the response a year later, Journal of Vascular and Interventional Radiology. Lower extremity endovascular interventions for Medicare beneficiaries. Comparative effectiveness as a function of provider specialty. Conclusion, Medicare data shows that endovascular lower extremity vascularization by vascular surgeons results in more transfusions and ICU use, longer hospital stay, more repeat revascularization procedures or amputations, and higher costs compared with procedures performed by interventional radiologists. The anticipated response from Dr. Cambria. To those with any knowledge of vascular disease, this article will be seen as self-serving and scientifically flawed. Well, the unavoidable end result of this mudslinging is that everyone gets dirty. Last year, the comparative effectiveness of surgeons over interventionalists in endovascular repair of abdominal aortic aneurysms. Physician specialty is associated with, with patient outcomes. Surgeons are associated with improved outcomes, with lower mortality, shorter length of stay, and lower charges for EVAR cases when compared with interventionalists. Last year, this was obviously highlighted in vascular specialists at the annual meeting, again as evidence of specialty superiority. And in the commentary, fast forward to 2013, where everybody wants to be a vascular surgeon. Cardiologist, interventional radiologist, nephrologist, dermatologist, vascular medicine physicians, and many others. Why the dramatic change? For the non-surgeons, the reason is the development of minimally invasive technology that has allowed any specialist with catheter-based skills to participate in vascular care. But is it appropriate for non-surgical specialists to treat vascular patients? The answer from this study is a resounding no. 
Well, try not to do this either. This was 2005, and this forum sponsored a, a session on the future of vascular surgery, and in it we talked about this program. Obviously, as you look at some of the titles, you can understand how other specialties might feel under attack, threatened, and a bit defensive. So I think for any specialty, and now we're not just vascular surgery, IR, and interventional cardiology, many institutions are dealing with the term interventional nephrologist, interventional neurologist, interventional neurosurgeons, probably interventional pathologists eventually, but, or veterinarians. But I think for any specialty, it's important to know that in for a fee-for-service environment, unfettered by enforced clear borders, one danger that can tempt especially is mission creep, with resultant unsavory, unintended consequences for patients and healthcare quality. It's not unlike this phenomenon, which starts relatively innocuous when, but it leads in oftentimes in directions to unanticipated complexities, unexpected complications, and ultimately less than edifying result. Starts maybe by trying to help someone, by undertaking an unfamiliar challenge. We have a car that's rolled off a pier. We have a truck or a crane. Probably not used to doing this, but let's give it a try. We get the car up, it's moving, and that falls in. So more people come, more people are involved, we have more support. We get the next truck, we try to lift this off. It looks good when the car comes, but we try and get the truck, it goes in. So we get a third truck, and we start. Okay, let's take the positive side. We'll leave negative and head to the flip side of positive. Specifically, what can you do to help establish a more robust and fruitful relationship with peers interested in vascular disease? Four things. Uh, Peter asked for three or four. Here are four, four areas, and we'll talk a little about this in closing. Compliance quality improvement, patient care, clinical activities, research clinical trials, education teaching missions. Many of these come from experience I've had at Stanford, but I've also called from other centers that I think have very good uh, programs in place. Uh, compliance quality improvement. I'm a big believer in common credentialing process with identical criteria for specific procedural privileges, irrespective of department of discipline. Secondly, I believe in multidisciplinary QA, whether you call it M&M, PPEC, et cetera, for endovascular procedures divided in territories where there's overlap neuro, peripheral visceral, aorta, venous. And I think if you can accomplish that, there's more opportunity for this synergy to attack institutional harmonization to promote best practice of evidentiary care, procedural appropriateness guidelines, establishment of case cost standards, uniform patient services, and strategic plannings in area of inventory and billing. Patient care clinical activities. Share vascular, endovascular clinic space and times. We do that at Stanford. We're in the same clinic space. Emergency or transfer patients. Establish a rotating referral system. For example, at Stanford, we have a rotating monthly system of who does aortic trauma. The whole point is to break down barriers to, uh, to work together and communicate. And you could establish synergistic inclusive care teams that recognize the value of relevant stakeholders to optimize care, such as a heart team we have at Stanford for TAVR or hybrid coronary vascularization. The upcoming BEST trial is going to invoke CLI teams to review patients prior to being enrollment, or an acute PE team. All of these are ideas I think, again, can uh, forge some better communication and some synergy in groups working together who all have interest in vascular disease. So my possible blueprint, blueprint Institute common credentialing criteria for the same endovascular procedures regardless of specialty, and there are a lot of new specialties to consider. Establish multidisciplinary QA proceedings. Develop procedural appropriateness criteria created by multilateral council of stakeholders. And explore opportunities for an integrated transdisciplinary model for delivery of vascular care. The point is, at each institution is going to be different, and many it will undoubtedly require institutional leverage to really pull this off. But the point is, you need to start thinking about taking small, concrete steps, the purpose of which may be only to illuminate the next small step you should take. Research clinical trials. There's certainly power in numbers. Greater institutional influence supports when a united front exists. When you have an army going to the hospital or the institution, you usually get heard uh, in a better way. 
Shared database and infrastructure expense, that's a problem for everyone. If you go together, there may be, again, possibilities in a combined approach. Funding agencies encourage and favor multidisciplinary submissions. I think we're all aware of that now. And an engaged multi-specialty team facilitates investigational trial enrollment. Educational training missions, certainly weekly case conferences with mandatory attendance, I think can do a lot to providing communication and opening up paths of dialogue. Integrated educational curriculum with interdisciplinary clinical care rotations for trainees. This is something that I think many sites are, are doing. Multidisciplinary local regional educational outreach programs, outreach to physicians, to patients, to EMTs, to companies, doing it in a shared way. And community screening and counseling for vascular disease, which every specialty does on their own, but certainly you could share that in a coordinated volunteer effort. Well, it's not unlike uh, what Max Planck said. Uh, I find the observation regarding the adoption of changes in science fittingly apropos to our discussion today. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather its opponents eventually die, and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. So, finally, in conclusion, for your consideration, what should the role of the SVS be in the future? Well, I see the SVS, and I've been a member of this society for over 20 years, as a big tent meeting forum the house for all things vascular. It should encourage multidisciplinary participation, honor multi-specialty contributions, and denounce tribalism. It should embrace an inclusive approach to future initiatives. It should publicly recognize and prominently promote the value of collaborative synergy and truly own the vascular space more than anyone else. Plan an ecumenical flag for all parties interested in vascular disease to rally around and support. And maybe in 10 years, who knows, the Society for Vascular Surgery becomes the Society for Vascular Specialists. Well, is multidisciplinary in your future? Is that inconceivable? Now more than ever, many would say, we think not. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mike. That was great. Um, our next speaker is Tim Ferriss. Tim is a physician. He lives in Boston and actually has talked to the SVS in the past, a friend of, of Rich Cambria's. And when we were looking for someone who might uh, have an instituted a creative program to deal with appropriateness of procedures, uh, Rich mentioned Tim as the possibility. He's a senior vice president for population health management at MGH. He's in their physician organization and partners healthcare, but most importantly, he's the director of a relatively new program called Procedure Appropriateness Program. And Dr. Ferris is going to talk about hospital and physician practice organizations and their impact or potential impact on appropriateness of vascular surgery care. Dr. Ferris. Great. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to try to make up some time here. These two presentations I found absolutely um, fascinating and couldn't have better uh, set up if you think of them as going from macro uh, Washington health policy to um, uh, organizational issues. I'm going to get right down to what an organization that is in an environment like Massachusetts where we really have no choice. We are taking on risk for the cost of care that is both uh, a contractual and, um, and uh, it is um, in the laws now and our agreements um, or forthcoming agreements which have been in the news um, with our Attorney General. So this is our problem, the overuse uh, and appropriateness of, of uh, it is no longer somebody else's problem. How do we as an organization deal with that problem um, and do it in a way that we think it's um, best possible patient care and very importantly consistent with the ethics of uh, the delivery of great health care. Uh, so we have come up with a solution. I, I wrote nothing to disclose. It occurs to me we actually have a piece of software that's on the market. I do not personally have any stake in it, but our institution does, and therefore I think that creates an institutional conflict of interest if I understand um, the way these things work. So I, I, I do want to say that. I will describe that software that we're using. Um, so here's the, the way it, it looks on the, on the outside. Um, it doesn't have to be your own specialty that gets
that's tarred with the overuse. I learned a lot here about, and, and maybe some of my preconceptions about overuse of vascular procedures have, uh, have now come under some correction here. But the fact is that there are repeated publications, scientific publications, demonstrating overuse. And when they show up anywhere in healthcare, it tars all of healthcare and um, the recent stuff that's been going on in New York City um, uh, very much made its uh, way into the discussions of politicians here in Massachusetts. And in our contracts with our payers, they said, how do we know that you're not doing this too? Okay, and that's the big question. How do they know? And now that we own part of the cost of care risk, how do we know as an organization? And this is about you know turning the guns, a lot of discussion about whether you're turning the guns inward or turning the guns outward. Internally, how do we know across specialty lines who's overusing and who's not overusing? Um, and, and so we've put in place a program, and I'm going to actually skip this just to get down to the, the specifics. We've described that program in a, in a couple of papers at a very high level. Um, when it gets down to the specifics, we have a very specific, what I would say, relatively comprehensive approach to managing quality and cost of care across, across the populations we serve. I'm going to focus just on one of them, but I just wanted this slide to show that this is part of a, a much more comprehensive approach because it's uh, fixing the cost escalation problem in healthcare is not just about appropriateness, but appropriateness is on the list. So let's get to appropriateness uh, um, and, and just say, um, uh, what do we know about how we can do better in appropriateness? Um, this is a, uh, actually something that will be forthcoming in uh, Annals of Surgery. And, um, and it's basically a schema of a patient encountering a surgeon. Maybe any physician, but but in specifically in this case, a surgeon. First, you have a patient with a surgical problem. In Boston, the time between the patient with a surgical problem and the encounter with a physician can be measured in a New York minute, right? So um, uh, it's very short amount of time. We have great access. We have great um, uh, uh, triage here. So. Um, we identify a possible f need for procedure. There's an informed consent. We schedule the OR. We do the pre-procedure testing. We do the procedure, and then the recovery. If you were going to design this encounter and include what has been scientifically shown to optimize those steps, you would actually include a few additional steps. We, we do these additional steps in research trials. We tend not to do them in the practice of medicine on a day-to-day -day basis because it's expensive. And heretofore, we haven't had the justification for doing this. So what would we do? We would do um, patient-reported outcome surveys at baseline. We would get baseline status of symptoms and record that not just for our randomized trials, but, but actually for everyone that, that we see. We would assess what we're doing prospectively against appropriateness criteria. And I'll come back to this point. We would um, engage the patient in valid shared decision making uh, around an elective case, make sure they understand the risks and benefits. Um, we would ask them to sign not a general consent form, but a consent form that actually um, spells out their specific risks. That's what computers are for. We actually can calculate individual specific risks by procedure. We could even potentially do it by surgeon. Wouldn't want to go there anytime soon. Um, but uh, certainly we could get institutional numbers. Um, and then we would measure short-term and long-term outcomes and continually improve, right? Uh, wonderful academic exercise. How does that become part of actually um, practice. Well, we've created a piece of software that tries to do this. We call it PROE, Procedure Order Entry. It's based on the, the, the uh, same kind of research that was done by David Bates in the 90s around uh, laboratory order entry, showing that if you provide decision support in the process of physician decision making, you actually can show that there is, uh, in aggregate, better decision making. So what we do is we, um, we actually populate this appropriateness data registry using natural language processing. We don't want our physicians to be data entry clerks. Um, so we pre-populate the data. So for example, if the ultrasound shows a 52% stenosis of the carotid artery, 
that's not in a structured field in our data systems, so we can pull it out. We then enter it into our database. We ask the physician, the surgeon who is proposing to do the procedure, a surgeon or any procedure, uh, uh, any specialty, to review the appropriateness criteria and say, yeah, I want to proceed. We then have outputs from this. So procedure scheduling. So you output this, you say, yep, I'm going to go to the OR, I'm going to do the scheduling. We're going to follow on internal to performance dashboards. We're actually going to re report it publicly, um, and I'll show you some early work in that. We're, we've engaged with our payers. We said, if we do this to ourselves, can't we get out of prior authorization? And actually, the answer from our payers has been yes. If you do this to yourselves and, it's, and the results are auditable, we will give you a gold card on prior authorization. We've calculated that at Mass General Hospital, there are 30 FTEs who, it's actually spread across many more, but the equivalent of 30 FTEs whose sole job is to do the paperwork associated with all the different prior authorizations in our procedures. So not added value in healthcare. Uh, that work. So we'll get, we'll get out of uh, billing and prior authorization problems and um, provide the personalized consent form. So here I'm going to go to um, the early adopters and, and again I want to um, highlight Dr. Cambria who I have the, the um, uh, pleasure of working with um, and referring my patients to. We started in CAS and CEA. It is really interesting that um, we started there because it's one of the most difficult areas because of this issue of multiple specialists at Mass General all looking at this same territory. And um, what was interesting, I was invited into these discussions um, because to create a computer program that's going to do appropriateness criteria, you actually have to decide how you think. And, and if that computer program is going to be used by all the specialties in your institution, which ours is, everyone's got to agree. It turned out that in the first meeting, 80% just it was easy, agreement about everything. The next 20%, 15%, there was a discussion, sometimes heated discussion. The last 5%, Disagreement. We disagree between specialties about when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. But you know what? The software allows for that. We can say, you know what? The legitimate disagreements occur. We're going to learn. So we're just going to know going forward what choices were made and we'll learn because we'll have all the information recorded. So um, what did we show? So we also did this in diagnostic cath. And this was a really interesting thing that happened. So we have been doing this in diagnostic cath. Um, and checking appropriate use criteria for over 90% of our diagnostic caths at Mass General for six months when a paper was published out of New York State that looked at the appropriateness of cardiac catheterization in New York State. You'll see there are three sections to these bars. There's the appropriate, the maybe appropriate, and the rarely appropriate. So 34% of diagnostic caths in this study in New York met appropriate, and then we're up to 70 odd percent met appropriate plus maybe appropriate. We hadn't had previous information about what we were doing, uh, about what the benchmark is. We said, oh, wait, we've been collecting this information. How are we doing on this? And met appropriate use criteria at Mass General. Now, I've been saying that to the payers that I negotiate with, and I've been saying that to the people in the State House, but they read the newspaper and they say, we don't believe you. Show us the data. We now have the data. This is really powerful. It is work to collect this data. It is an expense to collect this data. It slows our surgeons down in the office, no question about it. Having this data demonstrating you're, you're doing it the way your specialty thinks it should be done is incredibly powerful, particularly if you're doing this and other people aren't, right? It's a competitive advantage. This, is, this, is a, this is, has already been very valuable. We've only had this data now for a couple months. It's already been very valuable. Um, so these are the procedures that uh, we currently do uh, the, and, and the ones we're uh, adding. Uh, and, and so I just leave you with the, the last message that um, this is about um, the, the third bullet point on, uh, from the first presentation about guidelines and checking, and this is about um, not turning the guns inward on each other, but sitting down and deciding together what is our plan for how we're going to address this in c coming so to some shared agreement about how to move forward. So thank you.
Thanks, Tim. Uh, our next speaker probably needs no introduction. Uh, Peter Glavitsky was last year's president of the SVS and also is now the chair of the Docs or Document Committee, uh, which reviews uh, many general documents that are published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery and produced by the Society for Vascular Surgery. Surgery and included in, in that in their review are practice guidelines. And Dr. Glavitsky not only is a recognized and internationally known vascular surgeons, but he's been the president of, I think, six or seven different societies, some of them not just surgical, but dealing with venous disease. So he comes from a, uh, a broad background of interest in vascular disease, but has a particular interest in practice guidelines. Peter? Thank you very much, uh, Peter. It's a real pleasure to be part of this distinguished and uh, uh, quite colorful uh, panel. Uh, I was asked to address you the uh, role of practice guidelines uh, in the delivery of appropriate care to our patients. The question specifically that uh, Peter asked me to address is do guidelines imp impact appropriateness and establish enforceable professional standards? Does rapid technology transfer negate the importance of practice guidelines and should practice guidelines be multi-specialty? international or single specialty guidelines. So let's uh, take the first question. Uh, I don't know whether uh, enforceable is uh, something that uh, I, I could uh, endorse at this point, but uh, I would say that when the question is do guidelines impact appropriateness and establish professional standards, I believe that the simple answer is yes. Appropriateness means rightness, that we do the right thing. And in medicine, when you use appropriateness, it means that the use of a resource or service that is the most suitable or efficient manner possible. We uh, indeed uh, believe that we all should practice evidence-based medicine, which is the consens consensus explicit and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And guidelines, in fact, do that. Guidelines evaluate the evidence in the scientific literature. In addition, guidelines assess the likely benefits and harms of a particular treatment. And it enables you, the healthcare provider, to select the best care for a unique patient based on his or her preferences. Obviously, the questions that everybody asks, if you should strictly follow the guidelines, is it ever wise to disregard absolute practice guidelines? If you read this editorial uh, from the Texas Heart Institute uh, Journal, one of the uh, um, uh, editors says, absolutely. And uh, uh, he actually quotes a, a published case of a 60-year-old patient who had pulmonary embolism, was treated with uh, thrombolysis. Uh, in spite of the guidelines recommendation, uh, the uh, patient uh, uh, had two months before a massive pulmonary embolism, cerebral bleeding. The uh, treatment uh, uh, group decided thrombolysis would be the only one to save the patient's life, and it, it indeed saved the patient's life. So uh, this was brought up as a good example of our clinical uh, judgment uh, really uh, was uh, um, different than what the practice guideline recommendation. And in general, practice uh, guidelines should be uh, uh, used with uh, judgment and scrutiny. And uh, this article actually brought up a couple of, uh, uh, let me just, uh, go this way, a couple of uh, uh, issues with guidelines, that guidelines, as we all should know, only summarize the best available evidence, which often is weak, that uh, guidelines may vary considerably in how they are developed and written, in whether they are derived from expert opinion or objective evidence, and in how often they undergo revision, and that is something that's becoming increasingly important that evidence changes so frequently. Occasionally, guidelines are marred by conflict of interest and, and by clear cut, sometimes uh, intentional bias, uh, increasingly serves as ammunition for insurance of regulatory and insurance mandates, and sometimes mandates are proposed based on uh, uh, poorly written or insufficient uh, evidence. 
And then finally, also says that they tend to promote herd mentality in a way that all too frequently physicians view guidelines as items of dogma and follow them mindlessly. Uh, this is an inter interesting paper by uh, Dr. Gosgrove, a PhD at Harvard who studied conflict of interest and quality of recommendation in a clinical uh, guideline that was uh, published uh, by one of the uh, professional societies. And she specifically again looked at conflict of interest and was found that among the uh, six guideline developers, the uh, uh, average uh, number of uh, financial relationship was 20 and ranged from uh, 9 to 33. This is uh, a, a press release from an attorney general investigation that found, for instance, that flawed Lyme disease guideline uh, process were published and actually forced the professional society to reassess guidelines and install an independent arbiter. So we have a lot of responsibility as a society to uh, pay attention to uh, 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 issues like conflict of interest. Uh, this press release emphasized that, for instance, this panel improperly ignored or minimized consideration of alternative medical opinion or, and evidence, and several of the panelists had actually undisclosed conflict of interest. The Society for Vascular Surgery actually started out with guidelines at the time of the uh, uh, presidency of Dr. Enrico Escher, and Dr. Escher was actually very thoughtful, selecting a, a working group from the Mayo Clinic that helped with the SVS guidelines, and we published uh, guideline methodology uh, in the uh, um, uh, Journal of Vascular Surgery. Uh, we are using for our guidelines the great uh, uh, um, a rating uh, published by GAIAT, so we not only grade the evidence that is available out there, whether it is high, moderate, or low quality, but we also uh, look at the uh, risk and burdens and the benefits for the patient and grade our recommendations in uh, our guidelines. Uh, just yesterday, the uh, uh, board of the SVS approved uh, a, a, a new list of conflict of interest for patients, uh, for guidelines uh, that are written by our society or guidelines that we are going to participate in. There is no one industry support of uh, uh, clinical practice guidelines. Members, uh, members must have full di disclosure. Chairs or co-chairs will have no industry relationship. The majority of the members have no industry relationship, and the full disclosure information uh, will be published with guidelines. And this is indeed in line uh, of the guideline recommendation of the uh, uh, AHRQ, as you heard from uh, uh, Dr. Zwolak. Uh, using the uh, uh, system uh, that we described, as we have published in the last uh, six years, a uh, list of guidelines that indeed I think helped appropriateness uh, uh, in uh, patient care from arteriovenous access to carotid artery disease to uh, aortic aneurysms and thoracic aortic uh, um, uh, injury. Just the most recent guidelines that we uh, are going to publish together uh, done with the American Venus Forum is the Venus Ulcer Guidelines. It's currently uh, uh, in uh, uh, press, uh, um, soon uh, be published. Uh, I think it is important that SVS participates in multi-specialty practice guidelines, and we have done that in the past, and just the uh, very recent one uh, was uh, uh, published just a couple of months ago uh, on reporting uh, standards uh, for uh, cardiac catheter, catheter laboratory procedures. Now, Again, coming back to the questions, guidelines impact appropriateness and establish enforceable uh, professional standards. I think uh, it is very uh, difficult when you talk about mandates or when you talk about reimbursement or uh, when you uh, uh, talk about clinical practice guidelines. I think it is very important that legislative mandates or even reimbursement is based only uh, on appropriate guidelines that bring high uh, level of evidence and strong recommendations. This is just uh, one of the uh, papers uh, that calls the attention 
uh, on uh, uh, using caution. Now, does rapid technology transfer negate the importance of practice guidelines? Uh, I think the short answer is no, clearly because of the change in rapid, rapid technology, uh, prospective randomized studies are not going to be available, but guidelines indeed can address uh, 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 this uh, um, uh, technology uh, by uh, stating that the evidence is poor or lacking and the benefit of the harms cannot be determined. And more importantly, this has to be shared with our patients so that they understand the uncertainty and the benefit and the harms. Finally, should practice guidelines be multi-specialty international or single specialty? Clearly, if it's a single specialty, it should be organized by a national society like the Society for Vascular Surgery. There have been guidelines published by smaller groups and uh, those uh, were uh, seriously uh, uh, questioned. Uh, should practice guidelines be multi-specialty? You heard the opinion uh, uh, of the panel. I have to admit that the uh, Institute of Medicine's recent reports, when they looked at clinical practice guidelines, we can trust one of the problems that they found that uh, there was a failure to represent a variety of disciplines in guideline development groups. So indeed, I think we should be part of multi-specialty guidelines. Should it be international? There are pros and cons. The pro is that vascular specialists and vascular diseases are international. The problem is that the access to healthcare, uh, quality of care, cost technology, physician experience, and patient preferences are frequently different. I think we should do it, however, selectively, and we are uh, initiating and working on a global vascular guidelines on new classification and recommendation for revascularization for critical limb ischemia with our European uh, societies and the World Federation of Vascular Societies. I think guidelines are uh, clearly uh, here to stay. There are multiple um, recent uh, recommendations from the AHI crew and the uh, uh, Institute of uh, Medicine. Uh, there are now new uh, revised criteria for inclusion of clinical practice guidelines into the National Guideline Clearinghouse, as you heard from Dr. Zwolak too, and this is just the list uh, uh, that are important when you write guidelines, transparency, conflict of interest, appropriate composition, a rigorous uh, systematic review, evidence foundation and rating, the strength of recommendation, articulation of the recommendation, external review by public and patients, and appropriate uh, updating. So these are my uh, recommendations um, to reduce inappropriate use of vascular procedures. First consult the SVS or multi-specialty clinical guidelines to evaluate evidence in the relevant uh, literature and assess the likely benefits and harms of a particular treatment. On the other hand, use your experience, compassion, and clinical judgment to recommend the best treatment for a specific patient and make decisions together with your well-informed patients respecting his or her values, expectations, goals for health and life and preferences. So to me, optimal practice of evidence-based medicine is guidelines uh, based on scientific evidence and assessment of harms and benefits. Uh, this should be combined with the physician's uh, clinical experience and uh, the patient's values and preference should be uh, respected. In this era of new healthcare administration, cost is going to be an increasing part to define what is the best affordable treatment uh, for our patients. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much, Peter. Our final speaker is Russ Sampson. Um, Russ is a community-based vascular surgeon. Uh, he's actually written several articles addressing this issue as the editor-in-chief of Vascular Specialist. And he also, I believe, is an owner of an outpatient vascular center. And uh, he's going to talk about the ethical issues related to the frequency of vascular procedures. Dr. Sampson. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, I know you put me on last so that people in the audience can save their rotten tomatoes to throw at me rather than at the rest of the group. 
Uh, but this will be my disclosure, and that is like all of us in this room, I am, I think, daily confronted with ethical dilemmas that can interfere with treatment decisions. And so I think I'm proud to belong to the Society for Vascular Surgery that's willing to look at ethical issues in such a public and private manner. But this society cannot be responsible for its members because ethics is, after all, an individual matter. And I'm sure that the majority of us in this room place uh, their patients' interests ahead of their own. But like in any large group, there are going to be people that see the I in the word individual as being much more important than the I in the word ethics. So I becomes me, and me becomes the defining equation in the doctor-patient relationship. And this doesn't only apply to vascular surgeons, but applies to all specialties. And so I'm not going to limit my discussion here today to vascular surgeons, but really to all specialists that take care of vascular diseases. So when I was working on this talk, it struck me that the word individual may provide clues to unethical and unnecessary procedures. Because if you look at this word, there are three eyes in the word individual. And I think these three eyes are the same eye letters that explain why there are unnecessary procedures. And they are ignorance, incompetence, and indifference. And perhaps the most bad of all of these, the worst one, is the physician who is indifferent, indifferent to data, indifferent to results, and indifferent to complaints, someone who's indifferent to the suffering of others, someone who lacks the moral responsibility to being an ethical physician. And this type of physician has no moral compass and will do whatever they or he or she pleases. By coincidence, I notice that there are other words that I think explain unnecessary procedures, and these are not necessarily related to individual mischief, but I am going to describe them in the rest of this talk. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to list them here, but I will go through them in the talk. But first, I'd like to start with ignorance. And I do not want to come across with this talk as being biased against other specialists. But I will not stand away from a position that I frequently stated and that I state in vascular specialist, and that there are some people in other specialties that are not sufficiently educated in vascular disease. They do not recognize that they don't have the judgment nor the skills to offer appropriate treatment, nor do they recognize when they should refer to a vascular surgeon rather than attempt a procedure they should not be doing. And I think this is a critical issue. So how else could we explain a patient like this? It has a full metal jacket, superficial femoral artery that went to somebody and another specialist complaining of absolutely nothing and had the stent placed up their entire artery. So I can give that physician the benefit of the doubt that perhaps that physician was really uneducated about the natural history of PAD and to their credit thought that they were helping that patient to avoid a amputation, which clearly they weren't. So in those physicians, they think that ignorance is a choice, but I think that there are many physicians out there that use ignorance as an excuse. Well, what about incompetence? Incompetence is also an individual problem. So I think it's a little understood uh, fact that open and endovascular procedures are not generic. Not everybody can do them equally well. So not every golfer can become a professional and join the professional circuit, and not every surgeon or interventionist will be proficient. And some of the doctors will have bad results, and bad results lead to more interventions and more unnecessary procedures. Perhaps the worst eye is insensitivity, and that's the inability to recognize that one actually is ignorant or incompetent or lacking in moral char character, and therefore you're insensitive to the effects of unethical behavior. Well, there are other eyes that I mentioned, and perhaps the one most important is income, and really it's not really income, it's lack of income. And I think until the government and insurance agencies adequately reimburse us, there will be physicians amongst us who will see volume as the only way to rectify this disparity. I really believe that there were fewer inappropriate procedures when there were fewer doctors, fewer cardiologists, vascular surgeons, interventional radiologists, and where in those days they were paid more appropriately. And I think insurance issues also drive procedures. Now, we've already heard today atherectomy. And you can see this tremendous increase in the volume of atherectomy. Now, I'm not saying that atherectomy is not a good procedure, but I think we can only explain the fact that there has been this tremendous increase in atherectomy because we are now being paid for a procedure that previously we were not being compensated. 
So I think this, this patient exemplifies what I'm talking about. This is a patient that went to a physician in another specialty, uh, was found during routine testing to have no dorsalis pedis pulse. For some or other reason, the patient was taken to an outpatient cath lab where an angiogram demonstrated a completely normal posterior tibial and perineal artery. But despite this, the interventionist decided to do a pedal access procedure to atherectomize the anterior tibial artery, which resulted in an anterior compartment syndrome, uh, which despite the fact that this happened, the interventionist made many, many thousands of dollars. As you can see from Dr. Zwolak's talk earlier today, atherectomy is very well paid. Now, I do believe procedures like atherectomy and other innovations are important but I think they may spur utilization and cause unnecessary procedures because there will be physicians amongst us who feel that it is important to be the first to bring this new procedure to the community. Now that may be completely ethical if that physician is well trained in this new procedure, but what if the physician is just uh, jumping on the bandwagon with minimal experience and just trying it out? Probably not ethical at all. And I do believe industry can also cause overuse by promoting benefits before they have stood the test of time. And I wrote an article about this recently in Vascular Specialist. But they also seem to encourage adoption with minimal oversight as to who's doing it, the credentials of the people that are doing it. So really, why should they care as long as someone is actually buying their device? And then we have this position of inefficiency, the debate about whether we should be doing a procedure that will last for a long time or one that has a short time uh, to survive uh, but will require multiple procedures. So for example, take a well-paid atherectomy, laser, and stent of this occluded artery, or should we perform a poorly paid, very time-consuming peripheral bypass that may last for a long time? And you may question why I think indications may promote unnecessary use, but take, for example, a procedure that's not well proven, such as renal artery stenting or this new procedure of renal artery denovation. Should we not be able to perform it even if we're not quite sure that it has benefits? Is that not the reason that there's still so many of these procedures being performed out there even though there is data to show that we shouldn't be doing them? And then Peter asked me to discuss whether there were differences between paid physicians such as university physicians and those of us in community practice. And I think there is such a difference when you look at incentives. And specifically, I'm going to talk about RVUs and academic promotion. Now, as far as RVUs are concerned, I think that any uh, employee that rewards physicians based on this number may be providing a perverse incentive to do more. Now, I don't have a better way of doing this. But I do think RVUs tend to make people work hard, and I don't believe that the community practice surgeon uh, who is paying himself uh, is going to be incentivized by this manufactured number. The other issue is academic promotion, and academic promotion can also make someone do more, especially more is in the field of expertise where a surgeon has become renowned. So for example, if there is a surgeon in this group who is pra practicing and making a reputation operating on small aneurysms, that surgeon may find the need to operate on ever smaller aneurysms. And here is the area where I think the greatest problem with ethical lapses is occurring, and that is the lack of oversight in outpatient centers away from hospitals. I really believe that the majority of problems are happening in these areas. And the only time that an intervention occurs is when a major complication sends the patient to a hospital or a negligent act results in a malpractice suit. As long as our government and insurers fail to determine who should be doing what and when and where in these outpatient procedures, I believe we will have unscrupulous doctors let loose on their very unsuspecting prey. And we've seen this around the country. As I've pointed out again in vascular specialists, saphenous veins are being ablated on an industrial scale. You saw the 6,000% increase. And this is done by almost anybody with very little experience going to a two-day course, and they're doing this in outpatient centers. And furthermore, some of the cardiologists with little training and even vascular surgeons are stenting, lasering, and atherectomizing every single artery in these outpatient facilities without any oversight whatsoever. Well, before I go on to the three points that Peter asked me to speak about, 
I do want to point out that the three I's in the word individual, I think, describe why we do unnecessary work. But there is one I in the word ethics, which I think explains why we do what is right. And that is a, a, a specific quality that I believe everybody in this audience has. And that is the quality of integrity of being honest and having strong moral principles that prevents us from doing what we actually know is wrong. So what are my three ideas to ensure ethical behavior? I think that only physicians who are board certified by a recognized specialty, a recognized specialty, and who have been appropriately trained and credentialed should be allowed to perform procedures in hospital and more importantly also in independent facilities where now you can do anything. I think payment must ultimately be based on outcomes where not only the result is taken into consideration but also the indication. And I do believe that medical schools need to offer a course in ethics which everybody should regard as being equally important to anatomy and physiology. So finally, I think all of us in this room try to follow the most ethical path as honest physicians, despite the temptations and hurdles that we face in our daily practices. And so really, I would like to congratulate Peter and the organizing committee for putting together this symposium, because I think with this symposium, with this type of event, vascular surgeons prove that we are the profession that are most suited to treat and, more importantly, to protect our patients. And I appreciate the opportunity for this.